The topic of properties of radicals that we're going to look at is simplifying radicals. And what you want to think about when you're doing this is simply you need to be able to factor it into a perfect square. Okay, a perfect square. And that's when you're using square roots. But if you have other types of radicals like cube roots or fourth roots or fifth roots, you have to look for perfect cubes. Remember like what our perfect squares and perfect cubes are. So let's recall what they are. Okay, list in your mind at least real quick the perfect squares. Can you get up to 10 at least? Can you list all your perfect squares up to 10 squared? You should definitely be able to do that up to 10 squared. Go ahead, real quick, Luca. Okay, those should definitely be off the top of your head. And what about perfect cubes? Perfect cubes, you should definitely be able to do up to 5. Perfect cubes up to 5. Good. Remember, just take whatever's over here and multiply it by the base, right? Take 25 times 5 gives you 125. 16 times 4 gives you 64, because you're going from squares to cubes. And last, but what about, not least, but what about uh, fourths? To up to, up to 3, really. 1, 2, and 3 to the fourth. Those are pretty easy ones, I think, right? What do you got? And then 3 to the fourth? Good. Okay, four to the fourth and beyond, that's fine. And then you should just definitely know powers of two. Okay? So like two to the fifth is 32, two to the sixth is 64, two to the seventh is double 64. Computers? 128, and 256, 512. So there's a lot of powers of two that are very useful. But you should have these in the back of your head. They're going to be useful when you're simplifying things. Okay? So let's take a look. First, we're going to take a look at this simple rule. And the rule above tells us that if we have a product underneath a radical, that radical can be outside each of those factors independently. Okay, so the nth power of the product AB is the nth power of A times the nth power of B. So if you can write something as a factor inside of the radical, you can break that radical up. And the second statement is the same. If you can write it as a quotient, you can break that radical up for the numerator and the denominator separately. So take this rule right here. Okay, we need to apply this to the first example. So looking at example A, or part A of example 1 here. What can 75 be broken up into? What two values can fill in those blanks? And there's more than one answer here. There's more than one answer. Just give me general an answer. It doesn't matter, whatever you want. 25 and 3. 25 and 3. What's another possibility? It could also be broken into? 5 and? 15. Anything else that goes into 75 evenly? Any other integers? That's it, right? All right, now, which of these options contains a perfect square or perfect cube or perfect fourth? And how do I know whether to look for square or a cube or a fourth? 25. This is a perfect square. How do I know to look for a perfect square and not a perfect cube? Why am I not looking for numbers like 8, 64, 27, 64, 125? Why not? Because it's, it's a square root. Remember, we went over this last class. There's really little 2 out here. This is really a square root. Later on, we're going to see an example C right here that we're going to be looking for a cube root. So we have to put a perfect cube. So this is the perfect square. This is not. Neither are perfect squares. So this would not help us. Now, how does this help me? What can I write this as? Using the rule from the previous slide, if I have the product of 25 and 3 underneath a radical, how can I write it? Using the rule from the previous slide. I'm not asking for the answer, but I want to see how can you write this. Um, the cube root of 5 times the root of 3. Square root, right? Square root. The square root of 25 times the square root of 3. You can't say the square root of 5, because then you're taking the square root yourself. Then this becomes, as a result, then what does root 25 simplify to? Root 3. 
Okay, five root three. Does that make sense? Is that is most people seen this already? Is it review? Is it new? Some of it should be reviewed, maybe the smaller numbers like this. We're going to get the variables and see how expressions change a little bit. Take a look at part B. Work on that one on your own. Try part B. Check with your neighbors. See if you guys get the same response. If you struggle with part B, it might help to try something different if you need to. Because we have to do that. It's not the exact same setup as part A. Anybody get stuck? Because there's a point where you might get stuck. What did you do? Niall, go ahead. Um, so first I simplified it to negative, or root, negative root 4, root 2, times uh, root 3, root 2. So Niall started by breaking things down, and he recognized that both of these things can only be factored one way, right? Those are the only ways you can factor them. That's a good way to start this. Then what did you do? And then I simplified root 4 into negative 2 and 2. And next, root 2 and root 2, uh, root, root squared is just the base. So I got... Good. So you recognize two. that this is really just 2. Right? When you multiply root 2 times root 2, it's root 4, which is really just 2. So you get another 2 there, right? So I got negative 4 root 3. And that's correct. Now, that's one way of approaching this problem. What's another way of approaching this problem that might have been not easier, but just different? This is definitely right. Okay, because remember, root 2 times root 2 is really just 2. That's something that you should definitely remember. Like root 5 times root 5 is just 5 because it's really root 5 squared, and the square and the 5 cancel. A square and the radical cancel. What's another way to do this one? You just multiply right away. Yeah, you could have multiplied right away, which is not always obvious. And sometimes it makes it harder than it's worth, but this problem would actually probably make it easier. So 6 times 8 is? 6 times 8 is? 48. 48. What can that be broken into? There's something that's very easy to break that into that is a higher perfect square than what we saw in the previous breakdown. 12 and 4, okay, but then 12 can be broken further into 4 and 3, can it? 16 and 3. 16 and 3. And this is negative still. So this becomes negative 4 root 3. Same answer, okay? Now, quick note. I would definitely jot this down because this is something I see a lot of. Ben, uh, not Ben. Sorry, for, for a quick second, I was saying. Here you're going to look at this part and say, well, if you think about this as radical 12 times radical 4, how do I know that it's not completely done? How do I know it's not completely done? Into? 4 and 3. So in your mind, if you can break up something that's left into another perfect square, you didn't pick the largest perfect square. 16 is the largest perfect square that goes into 48, not 4. So this would really be root 4, root 3, root 4, like that. And then root 4 and 4 really just give you 4. So you get the same answer again by breaking it up this way, but breaking it up separately. So if you ever get to the point where you don't, you don't realize that you get the largest one because you get something else to be broken further into another perfect square, you want to go back and say to yourself, isn't there a larger perfect square that would work for this problem? Okay? How about part C? Cube root of 25 times cube root of 10.
Now, before you start doing anything, you could try to break these up, right? What, what does 10 break up into? Yeah, but are either of those perfect cubes? So now we're not looking for perfect squares anymore. Now we're looking for perfect cubes because this is a cube root. The perfect cubes that we know, again, this is what we have to be thinking. Perfect cubes are 1, 8, 27, 64, 125. Those are my perfect cubes. None of those numbers along the right go into 10, and none of those numbers along the right go into 25. So I can't break up 25 and 10. What do you got? But I can multiply them. Okay, and that's when you have to try different things. So this doesn't work at first. So write this as cube root of 250. That's clearly true for 25 times 10 is 250. And now which of these perfect cubes, look over here, along the right, which of these perfect cubes here go into 250? Yeah, the 125. Okay, so write this as the following. Because 125 times 2 is really 250. And then the cube root of 125 is simply 5. So the same exact rule that we learned a second ago for square roots applies. But instead of looking for perfect squares, now we're going to go ahead and look for perfect cubes. Okay, perfect cubes. And part D... Part D you can try on your own real quick. Part D we've got radical 120 over radical 10. It should only take you like 30 seconds to solve this. Okay, root 120 over root 10. Remember, choose the easy way to do these problems. It's hard to find numbers that go into 10 that work. And, 20, and 120 is a large number, so there might be an easier way to do this than to you know, break it up right away. What approach should we take here? What approach should we take for this kind of a problem, guys? What do you got, Luca? Yeah, so simplify under the radical first. So what's 120 over 10? Okay, then break this down. Okay, make it a lot easier on yourself. The difference between a student who does really well on an SAT and a student who performs at like an average level are these small things. And I know it seems minimal, but you could have broken up 120 and you could have broken up 10. You could have tried to break up 10, but there's no perfect square. So you could have worked with 120 first, but it's a lot more work. So look for the shortcut. Divide these two first. Notice that they simplify easier and then break them up a little bit further. Okay? All right, let's look at example two now. Example one and example two. So how are we going to approach differently? What do you think we're going to do instead, Ryan? Huh? Any guess or anything? No. No, no guess, nothing. Luca. Yeah. So. In the end, you can do the same thing we did with numbers. You can break it down like he was saying. So think of this as, well, you know what? The radical 3, there's a radical A, and there's really a radical B squared. Is 3 a perfect square? No, it's not. Is A a perfect square? It's not. So those we can't do anything with. So the root 3 and the root A, there's nothing we can do with that. But the square root of B squared is simply just B. B. Now, we're going to put absolute value, and I'll explain how that works. Because remember when we take the square root, we talk about really just the principal square root. Like the square root of 49, you would just say is 7. But if you were solving an equation that said x squared equals 49, 
you would say 7 or negative 7. And that was the difference we talked about in section 6.1. When solving an equation and taking a square root, you look at both the positive and negative roots. When simplifying an expression, you're looking really for the principal square root. So, in reality, this becomes just b. This becomes root 3, this becomes root a. But if b, say, pick a number for b, any value for b. 2. All right, so if b is 2, then b squared is going to be 4. So radical 4 just gets you back to 2, which is obvious because you started with 2, so you get back to 2. But pick a value for b that's not positive. Negative 2. Well, if you square negative 2, don't you get a 4 under there? And then since you're taking the square root, you're getting the principal of the square root, you really want the positive value of b here. So in the end, when you take the square root of a perfect square that's a variable, the answer has an absolute value around it like that. The way we write this whole thing is as follows. We take the 3a, put them together because they're both underneath the radical still, and we put the b out in front. So it's the absolute value of b times the square root of quantity 3a. When you're doing these problems after part a that we showed all the work for, here's what I think of. Think of this part here as the non-perfect squares and this as the perfect squares. Hey, just separate them. They separate them. Now, for part b, take a look at this. We've got 49y to the fifth. How can I separate that? What's 49y to the fifth? And separate it into perfect squares and non-perfect squares. Fill in the blanks. So I did 7. Well, you can break it down to y to the fourth, y to the, then y. y to the fourth there, and a y over here. Okay. Then, Where should the 49 go? Which spot? Well, it's just because it's 7. But for the sake of perfect squares, is it a perfect square or is it not a perfect square? It is a perfect square. Okay, so look at the approach here. Take your perfect squares, put them separate from your non-perfect squares. The non-perfect squares remain the way they are. So this radical y is going to remain. So when I carry this problem down and continue the work in this problem, this is still going to be radical y. What does the 49y to the fourth become? 7y squared. Okay, now, why don't I need the absolute value around this y squared? But I needed it a minute ago around the b value. Remember I needed that absolute value around b? But I don't really need it around y squared. How come? And this is really kind of weird, so if you want to just memorize it after, it's fine, but let's go over y. So it's squares, so whether it's negative or positive or positive. Yeah, very good, right? Remember, we're looking for the principal square root, which is the positive root. Now, 7y squared, that's going to be positive no matter what. Because even if y is negative 3, you're squaring it still, aren't you? So it ends up becoming positive. So you end up getting the principal square root no matter what, whether y is negative or positive. So you don't need the absolute value there. So the one I would like you to just remember is this up here. Okay? If you have the square root of something squared like this, you put the absolute value of b or a or c or whatever it was. But and when it's higher than that, you don't have to there. Okay, and we'll get into the next one also. What if it's like to the sixth power, and then it becomes y cubed, and you do need it there. Also, isn't y being radical, so you can't have a negative radical? Or red, y is being squared. That's a good point, I guess. You're seeing, you're saying over here, right? Yeah. Yeah, since you left over with radical y, could y, have, well, actually, technically, because we don't know what y is, it could have been negative, and then you're just in a set of imaginary numbers. So we haven't gotten into the imaginary number set yet, but you could y could be negative technically if it's an imaginary number as a solution to this. So you could simplify that way. But I, I see what you're saying because like you would want this to be positive, so you have to assume this is positive by default. Yeah, but technically speaking, it could be negative, but we just haven't done imaginary numbers yet. But we will when we get to it. But this is as far as we're going to go when it comes to the simplification. All right? So the general trend is this. Put your perfect square or perfect whatever it is here and your non-perfect part here and then simplify the perfect part and carry down the non-perfect part. Okay, again, perfect part, simplify it, non-perfect part, just carry it down. And I say perfect part because it might be a perfect cube. So how about choice or example C in this one? 
How about example C? We've got the cube root of w to the fourth over y cubed. Who can break this one down for me? How can we break this one down? Okay. Like separate first. I would separate it first, but yeah, you're right by looking at it. So what Nye already stated is that the bottom just becomes y. That is correct. How about the numerator? What happens to that? What happens to the numerator? I'm looking for a cube root, right? I'm looking for a cube root, so I need a perfect cube. Cube root. Cube root of w to the third and this cube root of w. Good. I'm going to make this a little shorter so it fits. And take a look at the numerator. Understand that it's still the same thing. w to the third times w is really w to the fourth. Kelly, why are you breaking it up the way you're breaking it up? Because, I mean, I would think that I would want a square up there, right? I want x squared. Why is it w to the third power this time? Because you're breaking it into cube roots. Yeah, we have to look at this right here. Again, remember, this is the index. The key factor is the index. The index says we're looking for something that is multiplied by itself three times, and that can be reduced. So this here can now be reduced to just w. And then we have a cube root of w over y. Okay. Any questions about this part? Let's look at the last part here now. Oh, we have two more, sorry. How about part D? 9w squared plus 9u squared. And don't fall into a trap, please. Remember, the rule we started with was in order to simplify, things need to be factors. Okay, 9w squared and 9u squared are not factors. These are add-ins as of right now because it's a plus sign. So don't try and just simplify. You need to do something first. You need things to be factors to simplify. So what should you do? Nope. That's the mistake, I'm just saying. Again, it's not, these are not factors. If this was 9w cubed times 9u cubed, uh, squared, sorry, 9w squared times 9u squared, you could have taken that approach. They're add-ins right now, they're being added together. But I need factors. I'm giving you a hint, so what should I do? Can't do that. Remember, you can't separate the radical around two things that are, these are added. These two things are being added together. It's like five. Imagine if this was five and four. What's the square root of the quantity five plus four? Think about this on the side. If I had this, what's the answer? What's the radical of five plus four? What's the answer? Because it's square root nine, right? Is three the same thing as this? Is this three? Look at the word there. Is that 3? What's radical 5? It's a little bit bigger than 2. F radical 4 is 2. This does not give you 3. You cannot distribute a radical to two things that are being added together. Is that clear? I want to make that statement right now. This is not true. You cannot do that. They need to be factors to distribute the radical to both or to separate it. What can I do over here? Yeah. Write it like this. Now, 9 and the quantity w squared plus u squared are factors. So I can write this as radical 9 times radical w squared plus u squared. What's radical 9? 3. And I'm done. I can't go any further. Simply because these are not factors. w squared and u squared are add-ins or terms when compared to one another. They're separate entities. They're not factors here. 
Had this been W squared times U squared, by all means, it would become absolute value WU. Okay, but that's not the case here. So that's all you can do with this problem. The reason I make this an example is to emphasize the fact that you cannot do this. Okay, you cannot distribute a radical to two things that are being added together. I really hope you all wrote that down because 9 out of 10 people seem to make that mistake on like tests or SATs. And you know what? Usually, one of the answer choices on multiple choice would be the common mistake. So if you had made the common mistake on this one, the answer you would have gotten would have been 3W plus 3U. And I guarantee you, 3W plus 3U would be one of the multiple choice answers on an SAT level test. Okay, you need to make sure that you're very, very diligent here. Think about your rules and how they really work. The last example says to us, the square root of x squared plus 12x plus 36 x squared plus 12x plus 36. What can I do here? Again, you cannot start by distributing. So don't distribute the uh, radical to every term. What do I have for this one? Yeah, this is really quantity x plus 6 squared. And let's show that. I can think of this as x plus 6, oh, x plus 6, it works out. So this is really radical, x plus 6 squared, okay? Simplify it, leave your x plus 6 as your final answer here. Why am I putting the absolute value around it again? Why am I putting the absolute value around it again? Yeah, remember, we're looking for the principal square root, and since it's a variable, we don't know what its value is really, so we're looking for the positive value, so we emphasize that with the absolute value around there, because we're not certain of what that number is. All right, the third thing I want to do for today, the third, some of you have heard this term before. Okay, now, to be completely honest with you, it's not an extremely useful technique until you get to pretty much AP Calc. You're not going to see much of it. Um, you're going to see it used in geometry for sure, especially when you get to trigonometry, you're going to see the application, or you're going to see yourself using it, but you're not going to understand why you're using it yet. The reason it was really used was because calculators weren't really around for a long time. Before calculators were around, you know, you look at radicals on a table. So, for example, if you want to know what the radical the square root of 2 is, you type in your calculator, you get 1.414, I think it's 2 after that, and then a bunch of other repeating or non repeating decimals. So if you had a problem that said, you know, let's say you had this. Okay? And you wanted to figure out what the answer to this is. And imagine you didn't have a calculator. You'd have to look at your table, find radical 3, write it down with all these decimals. Look at your table, find radical 2, write it down with all those decimals. And then you'd have to divide those two numbers with tons of decimals without a calculator. So before, that, before calculators were widely used, a simple technique was called rationalization. And what it did was it got rid of the radical on the bottom, and it only left you with a radical on the top. So if I were to do this, if I were to look at the bottom and I see that it's a 2, if I did this, if I multiplied by radical 2 over radical 2, that doesn't change the value of the expression. Remember when you find a least common denominator, when you're adding or subtracting fractions, you multiply by like 2 over 2, or 7 over 7. What's radical 2 over radical 2 really? 1. So you're really multiplying by 1 in essence. But what does this become? What does the numerator become? What's root 3 times root 2? Anybody, come on. Root 6, thank you. And what's root 2 times root 2? Which is just 2. Right, it's root 4. Right? This is root 4, but remember, root times itself gets rid of it. So now, if you had to now figure out the value of radical 3 over radical 2, you could use radical 6 over 2 instead. It's the same exact value. And if you had a table, and you didn't have a calculator, and you were doing this, you would look up radical 6. Get the value with all those decimals, and then all you have to do is divide it by 2. A lot easier than dividing a really long decimal by another really long decimal. So that's the reason it was really introduced. Now, 
It's also very useful when simplifying algebraic expressions that have radicals, so with variables and such. So when you get to AP Calc, you need to have, be able to simplify things when you have radicals in the denominator with variables in the radicals. To do that, this technique is needed. Okay, so I'm telling you now that the application is not always as obvious for all these things, but this is the reason it was really used. Okay, again, you can check this in your calculator. Type these two in your calculator the way they are, root three over root two, get a number. Then type in root six over two, you'll get the exact same answer. Obviously, it's easy for you because you have calculators now. Okay, but before that came about, this technique was widely used. It's also used algebraically, but not until you get to AP Calc. Let's look at examples of this. So how about part A? How would I look at part A? I could break it up first into root seven over root three. How can I rationalize this one? A little bit different than the last example, but the same approach. Remember, rationalize simply means get rid of the radical on the bottom. How can I get rid of the radical on the bottom? What can I multiply this top and bottom by to get rid of the radical in the bottom? Radical three over radical three. Making the numerator? Over? Three. Good. Questions at all? Can root 21 be broken up into something that has a perfect square in it? No, right? Root 21 is just 7 and 3, as you saw. That's where it came from. So root 21 cannot be broken up at all. This is root 3 over root 3 here in blue, sorry. How about part B? I'll write it as root 3 over root A. How can I rationalize this one, Kelly? You multiply it by root A over root A. Multiply by root A over root A, yielding an answer of? Root 3A over A. Okay, root 3A over A. Root 3A over A. How about part C? Part C is a little bit trickier. I'm going to again think about it as is written as root C, uh, fifth root of C over the fifth root of C squared. This is very tricky, this one. It's not nearly as easy as A and B. Hold on, hold on. I want others to see it first. You're absolutely right. Multiply by the fifth root of C cubed over the fifth root of C cubed. Can somebody else explain why Luca chose that value? Look at the denominator and think about what you get as a result if you were to multiply those things in the denominator. Yeah, it'd be a short one, right? Absolutely right. So look, we're trying to get rid of a fifth root, aren't we? So don't we need something to the fifth power? What happens to these two? They cancel, leaving behind C. Well, that means you have to sometimes multiply by things that are a little bit different. Okay? Again, think about what's missing. C squared, this is C cubed, C squared times C cubed is C to the fifth, and it's a fifth root, conveniently. So you need to multiply by whatever you need to get to get a perfect whatever this index is that you started with. Okay, whatever this index is right here, you want to get rid of it eventually. How about part D? How about part D, which is the messiest of them all? And I'll write it as two separate things. Well, actually, no, I won't. I'm sorry. I'm going to leave it for a second. Three x to the seventh y squared over forty-eight x to the third y to the fourth. I'm going to leave it for a second. I'm not going to break it up. Why am I not breaking it up first? What should I do to make this problem easier on myself before I begin to try and rationalize and separate radicals? Simplify. Yeah. So what do you what do you get when you simplify everything? Um, What's three over forty-eight really? 3 over 48 reduces to what over what? Wait, Not no. 1 over 16. 1 over 16, okay. So there's a 1 in the numerator, which I'm just going to leave blank for now. I can put it up there, fine. What about x to the 7th over x to the 3rd? x to the 4th. In the numerator, right? Yeah, and then y squared in the numerator. Good. Okay, Niles got his 
Rules of exponents down pad here. Remember, there's two y's up here, four down here. These two cancel with two of these, leaving two behind in the bottom. So this is what I've got now. Now I can go ahead and write it separately. So this is going to become the cube root of x to the fourth over the cube root of 16y squared. Over the cube root of 16y squared. What should I do next? This is a difficult level SAT prom, medium to difficult, I'd say, actually, but the kind of thing you have to be able to do. What should I do next? And there's two approaches you can take here. I think one approach might be easier than the other approach, but it's up to you to choose, right? The cube root of 16y. It wouldn't work. The y part is good. That would give you y cubed, right? But 16 times 16 is not a perfect cube. Close. What is it? Cube root, right? A 4y? Where does that come from? Make it easier. You're explaining way too more difficult, Luca. What's 16 times 4? 16 times 4, that's 64. 64, which is a perfect cube. And what's y squared times y? Y cubed. Y cubed. So they're both, again, perfect cubes. The goal is to get rid of the cube root in the denominator. So you need to make the denominator's radicand a perfect cube. So this becomes... 64y cubed underneath a cube root, and the numerator becomes the cube root of x to the fourth times 4y. Again, I have to remember to multiply these two up here, x to the fourth times 4y. Well, that's just 4x to the fourth y underneath a cube all over 4y. Again, the cube root of 64 is 4. The cube root of y is cubed is y. So that's an easy simplification once you get these both to be perfect cubes. The goal is to get a perfect cube under here, and both of these factors are perfect cubes. What could I do for the last step in the numerator? What could I do to simplify in the last step in the numerator? The denominator is done. It's definitely 4y. What could I do in the numerator, though? Yeah, think of this, right, as x to the third times x. So this becomes the cube root of x to the third times cube root of 4xy. And the cube root of x to the third is simply x. Okay, again, break up x to the fourth into a perfect cube since it's greater than 3. Make it x cubed times x. That's really x to the fourth. And then the cube root of x cubed is simply x. Okay, again, a lot of this goes back to simplification. Knowing your rules of exponents, knowing your rules of factoring, all the stuff we've been doing for the last, you know, two months now, really, a month and a half or so, all this stuff is kind of coming together with this. So you're going to see a lot of these ideas all in one unit. All right, so make sure tonight you practice this. It's not going to help if you don't do any work for this tonight. So you can come in tomorrow and be prepared. I'm going to give you a simple example for the quiz tomorrow for this. It's not going to be as complicated as this one here, but it could definitely be something like, it could definitely be something as simple as, let's see. Like A, B, and C are all fair game for something like this. For example, three, with the rationalization. Okay, so be ready to be able to simplify something, break it into its components, get rid of the radical in the denominator, and go forth with that. So I gave you normal assignments, but I also put a simple reading assignment. Okay, just read the first half of that page. <laughs> 